Leader Series. My name is Hend Azurayer, and today I'm very excited to have with me Julian Dunn. Julian is currently Senior Director of Product Management at GitHub. In the past, Julian has worked at other companies such as PagerDuty and Chef Software. He has expertise in product development and product marketing. Julian, thank you for joining us today. We're very excited to learn more about your experience. Thanks, Han. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you. Can you share with us um, your background and how you got into product management? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I have a technical background um, and I, after working, uh, I've been doing technology for about 20 years and I would say that uh, I jumped around a lot early in my career. Once I realized that I didn't really want to be a software developer for life, uh, but the notion of product management didn't really exist uh, back, or at least how we kind of do product management today, didn't exist back in the early 2000s. So I jumped around, got into doing web operations for a while, uh, and then I decided that I wanted a break from technology. And from there, I moved to New York City, and I started I started a graduate program in journalism, actually, in 2011. Um, I actually dropped out of that after a semester uh, for reasons that we can talk about if we want. Uh, and I got into doing um, technology again as a DevOps engineer. From there, I moved to a software company doing consulting and taking a customer facing role. And then from there, I kind of realized that that was, you know, having the blend of being customer facing as well as leveraging my technical background is something that I really wanted to, to, to do. And I found a nice bit uh, doing product management. And that's basically what I've been doing since about uh, 2014, 2015. Oh, very nice. And what do you enjoy the most about? product management? I would say that it appeals to me in terms of being able to break down very complicated problems uh, and uh, deliver great solutions for customers and listening to customers and just hearing their challenges, but hearing also just what they're trying to do with, with their companies and their products as well. Um, I really just enjoy blending a lot of, as you can kind of tell, I'm a generalist, right? So I enjoy blending a lot of different things, uh, both technical uh, stuff and communications and uh, sort of outbound product management, if you will, talking to customers and that sort of thing and blending that all together. And every day is different uh, doing product management. So I definitely like that, like that variety. Um, focusing on something like that's sort of what makes me not a very good software engineer. It's like the ability for me to like focus for weeks on like a technical problem is uh, definitely not, not, uh, not up my, uh, not, not in my wheelhouse. So I, I like the variety of doing product management. Oh, very nice. Yeah, I just want to take a moment because I forgot to mention for those who are joining us live, please uh, comment or uh, ha if you have any questions for Julian, please feel free to share with us. Um, and variety, I agree with you, product management, you, there's never the, uh, one, the same day. Um, what skill set uh, would you say is a must for a product manager? Well, there's a couple of skill sets that I think are a must for product managers. I mean, I touched on communication being an important one. Uh, if you have the greatest ideas, if you've met with all the customers, but you're not able to articulate that and get buy-in for your ideas, not only with your peers and engineering and design, for example, but cross-functionally across a larger team, if you're not able to really boil down the essence of what it is that idea is and sell it to other people, you're probably not going to be that successful as a product manager. Um, I would say the second thing is you are exposed to a lot of different pieces of information at different levels of detail and altitude. Um, and your ability to synthesize that information and understand what matters, what doesn't, and apply some editorial judgment to that, um, to be able to like weight different pieces of information um, according to kind of like everything that you've synthesized, um, that's extremely important. And the third thing is that really connects to the good judgment element, right? Is, and that judgment comes with experience. It comes with the longer you are a product manager, the more you kind of get a spidey sense about what what that good judgment is, but even if you're a, even if you're not an experienced product manager, having a point of view that you can articulate, and even if later on you have to change that point of view uh, based on additional inputs, but just to have a, a clear point of view that you're starting with, almost as a hypothesis for how you're building things, that's super super important, right? Because nobody wants a product manager that's like, well, it could be this way, or it could be that way, or it depends, right? People are looking to you as a product manager to at least articulate a clear 
a clear point of view and a clear direction for something uh, that, that you're going. Now, you don't want to hang on to that point of view too long. Everybody's telling you that that's not the right point of view. But to have a point of view to start with, that's also an extremely important thing, um, skill to, for a product manager to have. And for those that have difficulty with um, making decisions or having a viewpoint, what do you recommend for them to uh, do you recommend them not going into product management or how do you uh, build that type of skill? Well, it's really all connected to, um, it's really about the scientific method of developing products, right? Um, and it's the thing that you can learn and beef up over time too, right? It's about that, that the development of the, uh, um, the ability to have, to present ideas or pre present even a rough point of view with some confidence to sell people on it. And then the flip side of it is to not be so tied to kind of that viewpoint that you're not going to take feedback, right? Um, the I, and, and what I would say is that you have to figure out how to separate your ideas from you, right? Like if somebody comes along, even customers, or especially in early startups, right? People want to soft pedal and don't want to like hurt your feelings by giving you feedback, that's kind of the worst, actually, is it's better to find people that can give you really direct feedback about those ideas. And it's like, if your ideas are, are not good, then the way you should think about it is not my ideas just got my ideas just got pooped on, right? It's that I can, I can positively now use my time in a different area to explore ideas that are actually more fruitful, right? So to not take feedback personally about your ideas um, those are again all things that you can you can kind of develop um, as a product manager. But those are the kinds of things that I would I would bear in mind from a mindset standpoint. Yeah, and then are there any experiences from um, when you, you were uh, starting out in product management that you can share with us? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Well, I you know, one of the reasons I agree to do this hand is, uh, and I mentor other product managers, and why I'm a director of product now is. I'm hoping to help folks who maybe are a little bit older in their career of product uh, to avoid a lot of the mistakes that I made um, when I first started in product. Now, you know, eight years later, we have a lot more resources, PMHQ being one of them, uh, but a lot of these communities in product didn't exist when I, I was first starting out. And it was, hey, go and read a bunch of books and then go and try to ship some product and see what happens, right? Um, and some of the things that I would say that uh, uh, I would uh, guide people um, in, in terms of like things early in my career of doing product that I would say to, uh, to avoid doing is to not ship the code bomb. Do you know what I mean? Like to really think about getting feedback on your ideas very early. And in many cases, doing most of the work upfront, even before you have any engineers writing any software. Right? If you think about it, it's very expensive to employ an engineer to go and write software. So the more that you do up front as a product manager and validate ideas, even with rough concepts or even just spitballing and talking to customers about your idea and what it might look like, right? Or pencil sketches. If you're not a design person, like I'm not, I can't draw a straight line, but it doesn't matter, right? But it's just like get your ideas out there um, and get them, get get early feedback on them as quickly as you can. Because uh, again, it's about like eliminating the bad ideas as early as possible when it's cheap to eliminate those ideas rather than waiting for a long time. Because I've worked on products and again, this is really my career mistakes that I made to wait a whole year and you have a whole team of engineers writing a bunch of software and spending millions of dollars and then launching them that's ultimately not successful. Those are the kinds of situations that you want to avoid as a product. Yeah, no, thank you for sharing and thank you for uh, wanting to give that advice to um, those who are coming into product management. Now, I want to transition into mentorship and what mentorship looks like since you do mentor uh, individuals. How does that look like with you? How does it look like for me in terms of like what, what are the types of things that I mentor uh, yeah. product managers about? Yeah, um, or how people reach you if they are interested in um, mentorship from you? Yeah, you can definitely connect with me on LinkedIn. I, you know, if we, you know, just mention, because I get a, obviously a lot of like inbound LinkedIn notes and things like that. Like just mention um, that, you know, we, you attended the, the PMHQ uh, AMA or Q&A with me. Um, in terms of things that I mentor product managers and even like startup founders and things like that about are about some of the things I just touched on, right? It's the um, trying to like iterate as quickly on the value proposition, 
the other element is what you'll see that's a little bit unique about me is that um, in my career, I flip-flopped a bit between doing product management and product marketing. Um, and one of my core beliefs is that actually product managers, it's actually a core skill set that is often underplayed and underdeveloped in a lot of product managers is the how do you position and market your product? Because that matters a lot. Again, if you even if you have the greatest idea, but you can't articulate that to somebody that doesn't know anything about your domain or the problem space or anything in a clear way, then you're probably not going to get that viral growth. You're not going to get the attention that, that your product deserves, right? So I, I spent a lot of time working with product managers on, on the positioning upfront, again, before they build anything. Who is this really for? What's the value proposition? How would you explain this to a reporter? How would you explain this if, if somebody from TechCrunch called you? And all those kinds of elements, right? Because um, it also helps to make sure that product managers are not too internal facing, right? Because often many product managers come from a technical background. You can be like, look at this whiz bang new mousetrap that's going to be so awesome and it's going to solve these problems. Well, what does it do for the customer? What's the benefit that they get out of it? And then what's the quantifiable value to that they get out of it, right? So, and, and you may not know this from the very beginning of your idea, but just to have a sense about like, Again, most people who you're selling a product to are going to be worried about like time or money, right? And so just to have a thesis about how what you're doing, developing either your product or feature is going to give them back time or save them money and what potentially the quantifiable elements of this are. Are we talking 20% improvement? Are we talking about 50% improvement? And just to keep those value statements in, in mind when you're developing products. And that all goes into the positioning and how you explain uh, features and products that you're developing to customers. Right, because sure, it could be the greatest technology and it could be the most awesome newfangled thing. But if it doesn't connect to those things that they really care about and create that emotional attachment to them to make their lives better in some way that they can that they can quantify, then it's probably not gonna that's probably not gonna resonate as well as as uh, somebody else's product. Yeah, no, those are good. That's good advice um, for product ma marketing. What advice do you give for people to um, or resources so that they can develop this? I would say that uh, Product Marketing Alliance is an organization that uh, back when I was doing product marketing, I follow a lot. You should get a sense of like, well, uh, even if you're not doing if you're at a startup, you're probably doing the product marketing to yourself, right? But if you're working in a larger company, it's uh, often product managers think of product marketers as just like brand and fonts people. Do you know what I mean? But it's not about that at all. Um, brand branding is important. The identity of your brand is important. I'm not I'm not denigrating any of that, right? But product marketing and all the elements that go into product marketing, including like sales enablement, teaching your field how to position, right, and use cases and scenarios and all this kind of stuff. You can learn more about that through organizations like the Product Marketing Alliance. Um, there's also a few books um, that I recommend. There's one called Product Marketing Explained um, that I read when I was uh, getting just just getting into this. Um, and there's a few others out there. Again, um, uh, I'm sure I've mentioned them on my blog as well uh, in, in years past. My blog's at juliandunn.net. I don't blog there that frequently, but uh, I try to put some content up there about like resources that I find helpful and things like that. And uh, in this area, I posted some resources up there about uh, product marketing. Yeah, oh, wonderful. And I know you do have that um, article on what you learned from journalism um, and how you apply it to product management. Uh, and it sounds like you do apply it with the questions that you asked about what, how would you report to um, a reporter or the data? So any other tips that you can add on to that? Yeah, absolutely. So some of the things I learned about um, doing journalism that I think are very, very applicable to uh, product managers is number one, the reporter, when you're a journalist, is you're going into interviewing people that are not like you. Um, and to develop a quick connection with those folks, some kind of level of commonality and some way in which you're demonstrating empathy right off the bat for their situation, even though they may be nothing like you, will get them to open up more um, about uh, and, and to tell you about what is actually bothering them or the solution space or whatever. And then the second thing is about active listening, right? As a reporter, you go into a situation and you may not, your personal beliefs might be completely diametrically opposite to the person that you're interviewing, but your job is to be that neutral observer and to take down and synthesize what they're telling you without applying editorial judgment to it, 
right? So as a product manager, you can apply judgment later when you're deciding what to build. But in that moment where you're talking to the customer or talking to a prospective user and asking them, right, they may be giving you a scenario that is not at all relevant to your product or, or maybe something that you're not actually going to uh, going to go and do, but that input is still valuable. So your job is to maintain, I think, a neutral expression and to keep the conversation going and active listening and continue to ask them questions and don't pass judgment. And your job in that moment when you're doing discovery is also not to sell them your product or to sell them what you're doing, right? And you need, sometimes need to explain enough about what you're working in and the idea so that they get a sense and they can react to it, right? But if they start giving you negative feedback, your instinct of I'm going to jump in and start defending my product or my idea, you put, put the kibosh on that. Your job is there to listen, and that feedback is a gift. That gift is something that you might discard later. We don't love all the gifts that our parents or our friends give us, right? But we still accept those gifts with grace, um, and, we, and we decide what to do with that information later. The third thing that I would say uh, is just general interviewing techniques, um, of which I've kind of touched on a, a little bit just how to get people to open up and to, and to listen. Um, some tricks that I used, uh, and you'll, you'll sometimes hear reporters say that they leave the camera running or the tape recorder running after they've asked all their questions, because a lot of the insights that they get from, and a lot of the most juicy pieces of information that they get from, from their interview subjects is after the interview, after the interviewee thinks that the questions are all all finished, right? Uh, so I always end, often I, I end customer development with question uh, uh, a question that I learned in, in uh, journalism school, which is like, what haven't I asked you that you want to tell me more about, right? That you want to share. And often those are the kind of the best nuggets, right? Because that's sort of the unstructured portion of the interview. Um, and you wouldn't believe the, the amount of like just juicy nuggets and people are just, they've let their guard down, right? Because they're not being interviewed at that point, right? So they let their guard down and some, and, and you might get a broader aperture on the context of like why they're telling you the things that they are, why they're reacting the way that they are. You get a lot of information about maybe the cultural elements of their company or the political elements of their company. And all that information is information that you can synthesize and kind of use in your product decision making. Oh, very nice. Uh, very great tip. Very good tips on how to communicate with customers. Um, any of that uh, that you can apply to other stakeholders within the company, um, upper management, um, teams, uh, is there any other tips on communicating with that aspect? Yeah, I would say the same thing is about the feedback, right? Is um, and especially with your um, with your superiors too, right? Uh, is that uh, the feedback is is uh, generally is is directional? I think in most cases the feedback that you get from your stakeholders is directional. Sometimes it's not directional, right? Um, and I think as a product manager, and also once you become a product management leader, it's about making sure to clarify which of your stakeholders from your feedback. Uh, well, sorry, which of the feedback from your stakeholders all the way around. Um, is, hey, take this into account if you, it, you know, take this into account uh, or think about these elements, but I'm not telling you what to do versus sometimes the feedback is, no, I really, I'm trying to steer you in a, in a particular different direction. Now, if you're in a healthy organization, generally the top-down directives of it really should go in a different direction, those generally tend to be minimized too, right? And on the flip side also, as a product leader, you don't necessarily want to be dictating to your direct reports, to your product managers, exactly what to what to go and do. But uh, as you grow as a leader, I find it's helpful to be more explicit in, in saying this, right? It's like, I'm giving you feedback and this is take it or leave it, right? This is just, these are the things that maybe you missed or didn't think about or, you know, with my wisdom or whatever, with my experience in this domain or in the industry or whatever, um, these are the kinds of things that you might want to watch out for. These are other people that you need to talk to. But, uh, you know, take it or leave it versus this is a direction that I actually want you to go for reasons X, Y, and Z. Now, as a product leader, I think it's important to explain if you're going to say, no, it has to be this way to actually have good rationale behind the X, Y, Z. And it's not just using your positional authority to go and, you know, to go and control someone or, or dictate to them how the product should go. Yeah. Um, and was leadership um, something that you... Uh, trained yourself or d is there any like actionable steps that you took along the way to get to the leadership role? Um, 
What I would say is that I have been a leader before, although not earlier in my career, although not doing product. And the people management aspects of that, I already kind of had experience doing that. Um, and then I held a leadership role doing product marketing as well. And so a lot of the things in terms of the sort of domain independent things of coaching people, um, those are obviously transferable, right? And just, you know, just even what I just talked about, right? Uh, not like making sure that if you're going to like issue orders or edicts or whatever you sit, you're, you're sparing in that and really make sure that like that is absolutely something that you need to do. There's no other way to go and do it. Like those are all uh, tactics uh, that, you know, I, I used before I got into doing product management um, leadership. Um, I will also say, you know, companies that I've worked for before have had a really good culture of kind of internal uh, teaching about, about leadership and, uh, and just philosophies of leadership and things like that. If you're lucky enough to work for a company that, that is, uh, has intentionally trying to develop those leaders, I would say to avail yourself of those courses. They're not always mandatory, right? Um, but thinking about your own learning journey as a product management or uh, leader to avail yourselves of sort of generic um, leadership training and, and things like that. And there's also lots of books that you can read about, about leadership. Um, uh, one that I find extremely valuable is uh, Mindset by Carol Dweck, right? Just having a, a growth mindset and how to, how to also develop folks um, into having a growth mindset if they, if they don't and just, you know, being uh, open, open-minded um, about uh, different personality types as well um, is also something that's uh, super important, I think, as a leader. Yeah, the, that book is a wonderful book to build just a growth mindset into, in terms of not just leadership, but with, within everything um, product related as well. Uh, I want to take a moment and say that if you're joining us live, please, please feel free to uh, type in any question that you have for Julian. Again, Julian, thank you so much for your time. Uh, what advice would you give those that are wanting to transition from a technical background like you or um, and those who are tr transitioning into product management from a non-technical background? Yeah, sure. From a technical background, I would say that it's a the, it's never been a better time to be a product manager. And I'll say that because I'm hiring, <laughs> so I'm a little <laughs> self-serving in that. Uh, but it, you know, funnily enough, it's a lot easier to make that transition um, these days uh, because product managers are in such high demand. Um, what I would say is let's let's talk about the technical element first. Um, what you have to think about when you're coming over from a technical role, and uh, but by the way, I've had many folks. Uh, years later that transitioned from uh, sales engineering or, or sort of field facing roles that had a technical component uh, over into more of a product management role, sometimes apologized uh, to me for how much grief they gave me when they were in technical roles, when they were in customer facing technical roles, uh, because they don't realize at that time how hard it is, right? Uh, to, what, you know, what to be a product manager, because as I said, it's all related to what I kind of said before. You're getting a lot of data. You're getting a lot of conflicting data from a lot of different customers at different altitudes, right? And you need to make a call. And that call is going to satisfy, hopefully, if you're lucky, it satisfies the majority of the folks. Sometimes it doesn't satisfy the majority of folks because your audience, your, your customer base might be very broad and very, very, very heterogeneous. Um, when you're coming over from a technical role is um, into product management is you have to be okay with over time, and maybe a lot of this relates more to becoming a product management leader, but over time, you're going to be less technical. doesn't mean that you can't still do technical stuff on the side. doesn't mean you can't program um, on the side or whatever it is, but your day job and how you're evaluated is going to be less and less about where do you know whether it's a you know number three screw over here, if it's a Robertson screw head or whatever, all the technical nuts and bolts, right? But your job is like less about that increasingly and more about understanding the customer need and also being able to communicate and articulate that customer need and articulate the value proposition of your features and products. You have to be okay with that, right? To give to to, to give that up in part in your um, in your role moving over over to product management. The other thing is you're not dictating to engineers what to do. That's the other element of it, right? So I, I you know, again, I brought over folks from sometimes sales backgrounds or even from engineering backgrounds that are like they perceive that the product manager's job is to like dictate to engineers what to do. And that is not what product management is about, right? It's about creating the shared context between yourself 
your engineering counterpart and your design counterpart and to try and drive as much consensus as possible to make a product that's both usable, performant and feasible and also delightful from a design standpoint. That's going to that, that's going to be awesome, awesome for customers. Right. So you're working with those people as counterparts, as equals, as peers. And you're not like the CEO of your product where you're just pushing down orders to people. Right. Um, so that's the sort of technical side coming from a technical background over to product management. Now, if you're non-technical and coming over to product management, now the benefits of that are often you're coming from customer facing roles like customer success or even business roles or finance roles and things like that. So your acumen is going to be on planning on maybe, uh, you know, on financial planning, on uh, market sizing, right, so, uh, addressable market and all that kind of stuff, the business side of things. But now what you're going to need to make up for is like all the things that the technical team brought to the table that you don't have, right? Which is how are you going to go talk to engineers and, to, and for you to learn enough about the technology to be deliberate with them. Now, I wouldn't necessarily say, again, it depends on the type of product that you're working on, but I wouldn't necessarily say that it means that if you're coming from a non-technical background that you need to go and like go into boot camp and program and take programming courses or whatever. Maybe you do and maybe you don't. Depends on the type of product, right? But it's about understanding what the life of your engineers and your designers is going to be right, and to and to create enough empathy for them, and to create a level of trust with them, um, and and to bring them insights to partner with them, as I was saying, as your peers to build that product that's delightful, feasible, usable, etc. Um, for your customer. Yeah, thank you for that. That's great knowledge. Just understanding the language uh, to be able to talk the talk. Uh, speaking of design, there is a question on how to understand and design solutions that can solve the average user's needs versus enterprise customers' needs? I'll answer this with a, in a slightly different way than I think it's been phrased because I think that sometimes we have this unnatural line between when we say like, when we say B2C versus B2B or enterprise versus small teams and things like that. It's really about once you get to a large enough scale, right, even your average users are kind of the enterprise needs. Um, what I would say is to level up and be like, what's it like to be a user that's, let's say, I work on developer tool, right? What's it like to be a developer that's working for an organization that has 20,000 developers versus one that's where you're working on uh, an organization that has 20 developers? Well, you have some commonalities. You still, you know, you still need to work and collaborate with your team, with your immediate team. And if you're 20 developers, that's it. That's kind of the people you need to collaborate with. At a larger scale, you have more things like consistency and governance and information sharing and specialization of roles and things like that that come into account. Right? right. The level of, of, of control and of the aperture of visibility, if you will, for those users within those large companies, within large enterprises is somewhat smaller. And what those organizations in, broad, in the broad are gonna try to do is to create, uh, you know, is to, imp is to create democracy and sharing without anarchy. I'm borrowing a line from a customer that I talked to a couple of weeks ago where he said, Julian, you know, what we need in your product is like, less anarchy while still maintaining that level of democracy and collaboration, right? So despite sort of the, uh, I think the talk track out there about like enterprise customers um, being different in terms of the needs and wants of somehow it's like, because uh, CIOs, for example, are purchasing software for an entire company. Uh, it's not bad. It's not like the nineties where they're just buying something and like forcing it down the throats. Of, of developers, at least in my world anymore, right? It's still, those needs are still very, very similar. There's just maybe more, more specialization. Um, and again, and also what I was saying with respect to the value is uh, when you're selling to large, when you're selling to enterprise organizations, the value statements and the quantifiable value uh, matters a lot more. So those are some of the other things that, that you also need to think about weaving into your product. Thank you. Uh, I know we're short on time. Um, I want to ask you one more question. Uh, is there anything that I didn't ask you that you want to share with me? Uh, that's. I knew you were going to ask me that, Hen, <laughs> because I brought it up. Um, what I would say is, um, let's see. Regarding product management or just general advice. 
Yeah, regarding product manager, I guess one of the things I maybe didn't touch on before of values that I look for in product managers is that curiosity. I hope I kind of like, I kind of wove that through uh, what I talked about today, but just like the curiosity, not only about your own domain, but also about other domains that are maybe related to product manager, right? And so, for example, like I read the newspaper, I read the physical newspaper, I try to pay attention to world events and just macro, macroeconomic trends, and I pay attention to other areas of technology that aren't my own in, in developer tools, because that truly is where innovation comes from. It's a cross-pollination of what you do today in your area with ideas and practices and maybe technological innovations in other areas of society um, that you hadn't even thought about, right? So keeping that open mind and being curious about other people's work and other domains, I think is also a key, uh, a key factor for success um, doing product management and how you get ahead. Yeah, no, that goes back to the book that you mentioned earlier on that growth mindset, just having an open mind um, in general. We did get one more question that popped in. Do you, would, would we be able to um, answer it? Uh, sure. Yeah. Okay. How do you deal with the trade-off between business pressure versus customers, the revenue generating feature against the customer demanded cheap or free? Um, yeah, this one's a, this one is sort of a classic uh, product management trade-off thing, right? What I would say is um, you don't, if you're really truly a product-led company, and if you say that you're going to be a product company, right, then it means that you are you know, you want to be building products and features for a market. And that means to not create specials and special features just for individual customers. Now, sometimes it's unavoidable, right? And right, if your customers, if you have, and if, especially I think early, if you're an early stage startup, but even when you're an early stage startup, you want to be like super, super careful about starting to position yourself like, oh, we signed an SOW with an early customer. And so now they're like writing into a contract, like literally features that we want to build. At that point, you're not a product company, right? Effectively, at that point, you're a systems integrator, right? You're like a Deloitte or something like that. So you want to be like extremely, extremely careful about your philosophy and how you position, position those things, right? I think that that's what this question is, is getting at, um, Terry. Um, but... Uh, you know, even if those, and I've been in those situations before, we call them specials in product management. And to the extent that you can to try to push back, I don't mean to say no, absolutely not. We're not going to do these things, right? Because if the customer is big enough, of course they have a cudgel and no isn't going to be a successful answer, right? But what I found in those situations is more to say, how can we turn this into something that's a little bit more um, market facing? It will be reusable by other customers rather than just for the customer that's asking um, in which it's written into their contract or whatever it is, or the CEO has said, you have to build this because this customer is really important, right? So how can you change the nature of that conversation? How can you get that, that IP that you're creating to be reusable or maybe as a foundation for, for building other product features on top of such that you can eventually sell it um, and offer it to other customers as well? Thank you so much for that answer and answering all of our questions and feel free to reach out to Julian on LinkedIn, read his uh, posts on, on his website. Thank you so much, Julian, for your time, for your advice and for your expertise. We appreciate it. Of course. Thanks, Sam. Thanks for having me. Thank you. And thanks everyone for joining. Bye.